the heading is dot product in 3D. Now, as promised, a lot of the things that we've been covering so far in extension two vectors have been things that you knew from extension one vectors in 2D, and then we've gone ahead and we've added another dimension to them, right? And uh, that's gonna be today's lesson in some measure, but I wanna push on that. This is one of those wonderful places where you see you gain this qualitative difference when you move into three dimensions with something like the dot product um, that just isn't there in two dimensions. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, slight spoilers uh, for what's coming ahead. Before we get there though, as I've just established, right? You can't understand the dot product in 3D well unless you know what's going on with the dot product in 2D. And I know for a small subsection of you, this will look familiar, but for several of you, it will not. So I'm just gonna give you my like, uh, 90 second version of how I think about the dot product. And there's so many different ways that you can think about this, whichever way works for you. Um, I think you need to have some kind of metaphor in your head whether it's, you know, playing a video game or holding a bucket to rain or thinking about a windy day on the beach. Otherwise, you're just crunching numbers, right? And we do not want you to be people who are, we don't want you to be computers. You know, computers used to be people. Like that was their job because we didn't have objects that could do the calculations that we needed to rely on human beings who could compute things, right? We want to go past the computation and think about what does it mean? So imagine yourself on the beach trying to walk toward the water. And importantly, it doesn't matter where in the water you land, you're just trying to get to, you're just trying to get wet, right? So you're just trying to get out there, okay? Now, if it's a windy day, if it's a windy day, which it often is at the beach, right? Then the question that the dot product answers is, how much is the wind swelling around you? How much is it helping you towards the water? Or how much is it hindering you away from your goal, away from the water, right? Now clearly depends on two things, and you can see why this relates to vectors, right? How much the wind is helping or hindering you depends on which way is the wind blowing, what's its direction, and uh, how much force is the wind applying? I guess what is its magnitude, right? So in the case where, and this is usually the case, right? If the water's coming, sorry, the wind is coming out from the ocean and blowing at you, okay? Then it's opposing you directly, right? If we're coming at an angle though, right, it's not going to be opposing you as much as if it were like if you're directly walking into the wind, if you've ever had that experience before, right? So in these cases, what is the dot product going to tell you? Well, number one, it's opposing you, so it's going to be negative when you have this kind of opposing direction of the vectors. And if they're opposing directly, that's the most negative it can get. If you're sort of like a little bit negative, like this indirect situation over here, then your dot product is going to be lesser because the effect on you, the amount it's hindering you from getting to the water is lesser. Maybe it'll blow you to a slightly different point in the water than you intended, but you'll still get to the water, right? Now, if you think about if the wind is just running along the beach, it's gonna have an imp impact on you, but it's not gonna slow you down, nor is it gonna speed you up in terms of getting to the water. Does that make sense? It's just gonna blow you kind of sideways, right? You'll still get there if you're still walking at the same pace. And that's why when we say the dot product of two vectors that are, what's that word again? Now, in 2D, we can say perpendicular, right? But now in three dimensions, we would more use the word orthogonal, right? So if you've got two orthogonal vectors, like you heading towards the water, and then the wind at right angles to you, then that gives you a dot product equal to zero, right? So they're not really acting on each other at all in terms of trying to get to the water. Uh, we know what happens if one of the vectors that you're thinking about is a zero vector, then just by computation, like just doing it in component form, right? Think about multiplying the zeros, you get a dot product of zero as well. Because again, no impact if there's no wind, right? And then you've got these other situations where the wind is helping you, and obviously the more wind there is, the higher that magnitude, uh, the more it helps you out, right? So this is kind of our summary, right? Positive means we're acting in the same direction, Negative means we're acting in opposing directions to some degree. Um, zero means there's no impact. And the bigger, the actual size, because it's a scalar product, that's the other name, right? So we're gonna get a number out the end. Bigger the magnitude is, the bigger the effect uh, in either direction. Make sense? Okay, so now let's think about, let's try and come back to this idea of, what does that actually mean for the calculation of this thing? If we have, pick up pens, if we have two vectors, A and B, and we compute the dot product. We had two different ways to work out what this thing was. 
And we did it in two dimensions. Firstly, by saying component form, and then, hopefully you might remember, we used some trigonometry to get to an alternative definition. Now, what I'm going to try and do is go today, number one, in 3D, number two, in the opposite direction. So based on this idea here of trying to think about it's to do with magnitude, and it's to do with like how do the angles of these two vectors relate. Weirdly, I'm going to write it down, then I'm going to try and visually justify it for you, right? Weirdly, even in three dimensions, our dot product for these two things actually has the exact same definition as it does in two dimensions. You remember this formula, right? Or maybe you had u's and v's instead of a's and b's. Same diff, right? You need to know what the magnitude of the two vectors is, and then you need to consider the angle between them. Now, if you're like me, the first time you see this, you're like, how can this be? This seems weird to me that the dot product in 3D looks identical to the dot product in 2D. We're used to it becoming more complicated, right? And I want to try and justify for you why that is not the case. So, let me see if I can get an angle. Well, actually, first I'll face it in a more sensible direction. Imagine this as, um, well, when we think about our x, y, z coordinate space, right? I want you to imagine these as, uh, I'm going to put it now at an angle so you can see it a little bit better, right? We normally have the x axis coming out towards you along the ground. We got the y axis coming off in this direction, usually to your right, okay? And by the way, please stand up if it's going to help you because I know that there are sort of tall people in the way. Um, you got x, y laid flat, and then you got z coming up into the you know, height, up and down. Right? So far, so good. Now, what I want to try and convince you of using this, and you can also do it algebraically, but I find this much more convincing. What I want to convince you of is that when you have two vectors in 3D, you can more or less, for the purpose of the dot product, consider them in 2D. Right? Here's the way I'm going to do it. Um, imagine, imagine you've got two vectors that you're comparing together. Now, for the sake of simplicity and because of the fact that I only have two hands, let's just treat the uh, positive part of the x-axis that's coming out at you, let's just treat that as one of our two vectors, okay? And then the other vector is going to be this black one, right? Now, imagine, I'm going to do it this for simplicity's sake first, right? Imagine if I make it, well, just the z-axis, right? Do you see that? Now, literally, by definition, you can see these pieces of wood here that help you out. You can obviously see that that first vector and my second vector, they clearly share a plane. Does that make sense? I mean, in this case, it's the xz plane. So the fancy word for this, and I should write this down and so should you, the fancy word for this is that they are coplanar. Coplanar. Do you remember when we talked about points being collinear? Collinear means points on the same line. Coplanar means you've got two vectors and they're on the same plane. No big deal. Okay. So if I had a simple situation like this, x-axis, z-axis, of course they share a plane. Once you've written that down, look up again and have a look at what I'm about to do to this black vector. Right? Obviously, I can rotate it around along the xz plane, right? and it's still on this same 2D space. I can do this kind of rotation to it, and it stays on the same plane. Agreed? So I haven't, like, even though I have this degree of freedom, I'm still going to be coplanar. Okay? But now imagine what happens if I try and come off the xz plane. Okay? So I'm going to start again with this uh, simple situation, z axis. Now let's like put it over here. Right? So it's coming out sort of diagonal into the first octant, is what we called it before, because x and y and z are all positive. Okay? Can you see, can you yet visualize, I'm going to help you in a second, don't worry, but can you visualize the plane that is shared by the x-axis and my second vector. Can you visualize it? Right? Now what I would do, what I think is the easiest way to think about it is, start from the xz plane that we were on before, right? and then think about what would happen if, like how far do you have to rotate this xz plane, and in which direction do you have to rotate it, to get to my second vector? And I don't have to do very much here, I literally just have to let it go. right? Can you see my new red plane clearly shares uh, the x, z, that first vector, right? It's still passing through there, right? It's like cutting through. And it's also now sitting on top of my second vector. Is that all right? And I can literally put that second vector wherever I like. I can obviously come around to this side and I can play exactly the same trick. Whichever octant you're in, it's what we call a symmetric operation. So no matter which weird angle I rotate on, I've got a plane that my second vector 
is sitting on, and also that original vector, which was the x-axis, it's also sitting on. Does that make sense? So, what's my point? Even in three dimensions, if you think about the magnitude of each of those, it has nothing to do with being three-dimensional, but if you think about the angle between them, all you need is that one extra weirdo oblique plane, just consider that as your like what you're drawing, right? And there's gonna be a normal two-dimensional angle between your three-dimensional vectors. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is why our um, initial definition for the dot product in 3D is identical to the one in 2D.